But why do we need this formula? Because we want to calculate the eventually the SPM coefficient. Okay. But here let's calculate the cumulative nonlinear phase shift big phi first. What is phi is defined here. Output electric field over input electric field is defined as e to the minus j phi. Okay, in our definition, the minus sign is already assumed explicitly. Okay, so the phi means the negative phase shift. Okay, and it consists of two terms, phi b and the big phi. Phi b is the linear phase shift, and the big phi means the nonlinear phase shift. Okay, linear phase shift means whenever you have a refractive index, you have a propagation distance, you must incur uh, the linear phase shift, right? But it's independent of SPM. What matters is the second term, big phi. How to calculate big phi? Okay, here, delta k integration as uh, over uh, propagation distance, big L. Can you uh, take this formula? In the model of plane wave, how do you calculate the phase shift? Your wave number k multiply with the propagation distance L, right? That's it. Because in the plane wave, your wave number k is a constant. It does not change with propagation. So k times L is already the answer, the cumulative phase shift. But here, assuming your k, actually delta k, the change of wave number because of the nonlinear phase shift, a nonlinear optical curve effect, is not a constant. Okay? And why it is not a constant? You can tell the delta k formula here. Delta k, the change of your wave vector is n2 coefficient times your on axis light intensity. So n2 times i means the change of your index, right? And the change of your index times wave number in vacuum means the change of your wave number. Okay, so if you check this formula, n2 and k0 are simply constant does not change with z. But your on-axis light intensity is a function of z. And the reason, as I mentioned earlier, here, your on-axis light intensity, why it is a function of z? Because of the z-dependent beam cross-sectional area, okay, modeled by the Gaussian beam uh, theory. So without any nonlinear effect, this is already there. In the Gauss Guang Shu, the bin size is not a It will diverge. It will diverge. So, even if you look linear optics, the bin cross sectional area is a function of z. So, on axis light intensity must be a function of z. Okay, so in this case, your delta k is a function of z. Then, Delta k times L, your delta k is not a constant. You cannot get the cumulative phase shift by delta k times L. You have to perform integration, right? So that's the idea. Then, for example, if you are an observer traveling with the post peak, post peak means t prime equals zero, right? So like here, this is your pulse. Uh, pulse peak is here, corresponding uh, power is P peak, the peak power. Uh, pulse peak each travel. Now the phase shift is dosal. Okay, tag this formula. Uh, because N2, K0 are just constant, so this integration is performed with respect to on axis light intensity, I0. Okay? So the cumulative phase shift is proportional to integration of 
on axis light intensity at the post peak, okay? But it is, also, uh, it is equal to the fixed peak power. If you travel with the post peak, the power is a constant. It does not change with D, right? It's always peak power. So this is a constant. But your denominator is not a constant. Being cross-sectional area is a function of D. So you have to use the formula of A effective Z in the previous slide and to put this one into your integrant. After integration, you got the nonlinear phase shift. So schematically, the blue curve means your on-axis light intensity distribution as a function of Z. At being west, you have the largest uh, light intensity. And away from the beam west, light intensity reduces. Okay, so you got a curve like this, and you have to perform integration for this blue curve, but not from infinite, not from minus infinity to infinity, but from minus l over two to plus l over two. You only have to integrate over a finite range of distance. So after that, this is the area your cumulative phase shift phi at t prime equals zero means the area uh, highlighted by the uh, yellow tone. Okay? So is it illustrative for you? So this is the case for pulse peak. You've got a bigger phase shift. What happens if you uh, calculate the nonlinear phase shift due to some point at the pulse wing, say t prime equals some specific number t prime here. At this position, your light intensity is weaker, so you got a red curve instead of the blue curve. Okay? And you have to calculate the area between minus L over 2 to plus L over 2 still. So still the area highlighted by the yellow tone. That is the phase shift, nonlinear phase shift, due to the post wing at this position. Okay, then point by point. This is just a principle. If you know how to calculate the nonlinear phase shift for post peak or any other places along the pulse, you must be able to calculate the corresponding nonlinear phase shift distribution. Okay. Any question? Good. Then let's see how to calculate the SPM coefficient delta. Okay. According to the formula in the last page, nonlinear phase shift as a function of post position T prime is equal to N2 I0 K0 as an integrand and the integration over a total distance of big L. And if you consider double pass, okay, remember inside your maybe linear laser cavity, the median will be traveled twice in one round trip, right? So a factor of two is here, N2 is here, uh, on axis light intensity is replaced by P of T prime over effective beam cross-sectional area here. K0 is replaced by 2 pi over lambda. Okay, integration. But everything other than W square are constant, independent of Z. So the integration is only performed for 1 over W square function. Everything else uh, is extracted outside of the integration. And uh, the nonlinear phase shift is equal to the SPM coefficient times the laser power, according to our definition. laser power. 这个证明系数就是我们所谓的 SPM coefficient in our master equation. So you have P 
of t prime here, p of t prime here, so they can cancel with each other. So what do you have? Your proportional constant delta or SPM coefficient delta is equal to 8 n2 over lambda and the W square according to the Gaussian beam formula you can extract W0 square the square of beam waste radius and the integration is performed for a spatial function 1 over 1 plus Z over B parenthesis square can you calculate this integration just look for your integration table you can find the result it's an uh, tangent, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, inverse tangent function, right? Okay, so we got the formula for SPM coefficient. But uh, we are interested in two extreme cases, just like in the analysis of sexual absorber. In general, we do not have analytic formula, but in the cases of fast and the slow central absorbers, we can have formulas. Okay, so this kind of like that. Let's check the two extreme cases. So this is the repeat of the formulas. In the first case, we consider weakly focused beam. That means your crystal thickness is much shorter than the confocal, uh, confocal parameter. Can you tell the physical meaning of this inequality? What is the physical meaning of confocal parameter? Have you studied Gaussian beam theory? L squared. Within a range of plus minus B, the Gaussian B is roughly collimated without serious divergence. Beyond this range, the B starts to diverge substantially, right? So L much less than B means 就是在晶体里面的时候 你的病其实都没有什么diverge 这个叫做weakly focusing 对不对? 你的病在晶体走 几乎都没有改变出息 这不就是weak focusing OK So what happens in this case? In this case, check your integrand. Z over B is much smaller than 1. So compare with 1, this term can be omitted. So your integrand becomes a constant 1. And the integration range is big L. So what is your integral? L, right? So it's here. 这些是其他常数 big L So this is your result In the case of weak focusing SPM coefficient is this And you can see it depends on both the bean size W0 and the crystal thickness L The longer the crystal or the narrower your Gaussian bean you have stronger SPM coefficient, which is natural, right? Intuitive. What happens in the second case? Tight focusing. Tight focusing means crystal thickness is much larger than the confocal parameter. So it means your crystal is very long, and inside the crystal, your Gaussian beam changes a lot. That means tight focusing. And in this case, the formula uh, arctangent is close to constant pi over 2. So according to the formula, you got a SPM coefficient like this. And uh, surprisingly, the SPM coefficient depends on material parameters only. You see, 
it's independent of big L, it's independent of W0. If you are working with tight focusing, only N2 matters, but N2 is a material parameter. So this is sort of surprising. But uh, in terms of insight, it's also intuitive. Because in the case of tight focusing, only a small range of propagation matters, right? 整个L只有一小段有贡献，就是那一个聚焦最强烈的地方有贡献。其他的L都已经diverge掉了，SPM很弱，可以忽略。That's why big L doesn't matter at, uh, at the uh, at the end. Okay. And by comparison, if you use the most uh, easy model, the plane wave model, you get the SPM coefficient delta like this. And you can compare, it's, it happens to be the first example, weak focusing, as long as you replace the effective beam cross-sectional area by pi, WZ, uh, pi W0 squared over 2. They are consistent. Okay. So it tells us what? Actually, you don't need to use plane wave. You plane wave, and then finally, 截面积, ideally, plane wave的截面积无限大嘛 实际上当然不可能我们已经知道高斯光束的等效截面积叫 pi W0 square over 2 就把它换过去 哎, 你就不用做积分, okay, that's the result So it's finished We know how to calculate SPM coefficient delta so if you review the master equation, there is a parameter delta there. Now, in a real case of a curl lens Molag Tysavai laser, you know how to get the delta number according to the model we just show you. The other parameter we need is the SAM coefficient. It's a little bit more complicated. We know SPM comes, uh, comes from the iris, the aperture, right, as we introduced in the schematic diagram and the basic idea. So we have to analyze the contribution of the iris. Here we assume the iris is placed at a spatial position where the Gaussian beam radius is W. Okay, it's not W0, it's some value W. And uh, we assume the radius of the iris is Ws, okay? Then what happens? You can calculate the transmittance of a Gaussian beam of radius small w passing through a circular aperture of radius Ws, just like this figure, okay? So what is the transmittance? You know, 百分之多少的 power 通过这个 iris? So this is the way you can calculate. You have to calculate the integration of a Gaussian beam uh, intensity distribution, annular integration, but only from 0 to Ws. Because only from r equals 0, the axis, to r equals Ws can pass through the iris, beyond which it's blocked by the iris. It cannot pass. So the integration is performed from 0 to Ws only. And in the end, you got a result like this. This is your transmittance. Oh, so you give W, you give Ws, this formula will tell you how much will go. Okay. And what is the power loss ratio? It's easy. 1 minus T. T is transmittance. 1 minus T means power loss ratio, right? So this Gaussian function is the uh, power loss ratio formula. Then, by definition, the field loss coefficient L is defined as natural logarithm of input field over output field. And according to our model, 
loss coefficient is not a constant but a function of laser power, big P. And in the simplified model, it's equal to some linear number L0 minus SAM coefficient gamma times the laser power P. Okay, this appears in lesson three. So if this is true, how to, uh, how to calculate gamma? It's like this. Uh, performing partial derivative of loss coefficient with respect to laser power and then substitute laser power P equals zero. Then with a minus sign, you got gamma coefficient. If it is complicated for you, just try to perform a derivative for this formula. What is the derivative of uh, this formula? L0 is a constant, so after derivative is zero. Minus gamma is a constant. P after derivative with respect to P, a uh, P is one, right? So you have minus gamma. Then with the minus sign, you got gamma. That's it. Very simple. Okay. So you get the gamma equation method, is to take loss coefficient and apply it to P as a coefficient. Okay. And uh, we know the relation between field loss coefficient, small l, and the power loss coefficient, big L. They differ by a factor of 2. Okay? So you need uh, 1 over 2 for adjustment. And uh, then you, uh, you need to calculate uh, power loss coefficient, big L, with respect to laser power, P. But you can perform, you can get the result by the chain rule, right? Derivative with respect to W, the beam radius first, then performing derivative for W with respect to power, P, is chain rule. You can still get the same result. Why do you need to employ chain rule? Because in our previous page, the lo power loss coefficient is a function of W. It's not a function of power, right? Although, eventually, we know W is a function of power. Why? Because of Kerr lensing effect. Without Kerr lensing effect, W is a constant. Does not change with power. With Kerr lensing effect, you can imagine the larger the laser power, the smaller the W. So it's a function of power. But to this point, we don't know what is the functional, uh, what is the function of W uh, as a function of P. We don't know what the is a power of W. It's so you have to use it. 但这个要等到 beam radius as a function of power 已经知道了才有办法算 OK 所以目前我们先停在这里 OK so by substituting uh, big L as a function of power like this where uh, beam radius W is a function of power you can write down the formula for SAM coefficient like this but we haven't shown the entire formula because here the derivative is still unknown. We just leave it alone here for the time being. But according to this figure, we can already know SAM coefficient gamma scales with the fractional change in beam size around zero power, which depends on cavity design. Okay, so it's here. What is the second term? Derivative of radius with respect to power. It means rate of change of your radius as a function of power. And normalize to radius at zero power. So it means fractional change. 
rate of change， 在把它除上没有 power 的时候的 radius， 这时候的 radius 应该是最粗的，对不对？一除除过去就变成什么？啊、呃，改变的百分比，这个叫 fractional change。OK， so it means this one dominates the determination of SAM coefficient. If you want to have a bigger gamma coefficient, what can you do? You have to try to increase the absolute value of this term, to increase the sensitivity of bin radius with respect to the power. Intuitively, it's like that. 意思就是，我要设法设计我的 laser cavity such that whenever there is a small change of laser power. This term will be very big. Or in other words, whenever there is a small change of a laser power, the beam radius changes significantly, very sensitive. Then you will have a big SAM coefficient. Okay. But at this point, this is still unknown. It depends on cavity design. Uh, we will talk about cavity design, cavity design later. Okay, so guideline is efficient pulse shortening effect arises if two conditions are satisfied. Condition one, W prime p should be negative. Why? W prime p is this one. First order derivative of radius with respect to power. This has to be negative. Otherwise, you have a negative sign here already, right? This one has to be negative, such that the total sign is positive. You need a positive SAM coefficient, and uh, the necessary condition is this is negative. The larger the laser power, the smaller the beam size. That is the necessary condition, obviously. The second thing is. W prime p over W zero absolute value is as large as possible. That is what I mentioned. The fractional change of your、uh, laser beam size has to be increased as much as possible, such that you can have big gamma coefficient. Okay, so let's take a rest of ten minutes.